Hey guys, welcome to Telling the Told and Untold. My name is Tsoho. In 2005, Abe Fransman contacted journalists and told them that there was a killer in Philippi. Philippi is a small farming community in the outskirts of Cape Town with little infrastructure and no electricity or running water, or at least that's how it was in 2005. I'm not too sure how it is now in 2021. And if it wasn't for Abe, this case probably wouldn't have gotten as much media attention as it did and wouldn't have been solved as quickly as it was. On the 2nd of April 2005, Bonnie Swartz was on her way to the stores when she was attacked. She says that when she turned the corner, a man jumped out of the bushes and was buttoning his pants up. She looked at him and said that she didn't know him and he said that he had been watching her from a distance and that he was going to get what he needed from her. So she asked him what it was that he needed from her and he said that he was going to have sex with her. After this, he overpowered her and pushed her to the ground. And when she looked up and like sat up straight, he had a rock in his hand and hit her and this is when she fell unconscious. After this, he dragged her to a nearby tree, tied her arms around the tree, and proceeded to rape her four times. I'm not sure if this was before the ordeal, during or after, but her phone started ringing and she answered the phone, or I'm not sure, like, or he answered the phone, and her children were basically asking where she was, and they heard a man in the back. And afterwards, this man told them that they should come fetch their mother in um, the vegetable patch because she was dead. And after this, he left her for dead and she was found a couple of hours later. Similar to Bonnie, Alspy Jarvis was stalked on her way home. I'm assuming that her boyfriend saw that she was being stalked because he went to go approach this man and then this man ran away. Afterwards, Alspy's um, boyfriend started to run after this man and she told him to come back and that she shouldn't go after him because she like both of them didn't know who he was and he probably had like some shop items on him and it was pretty dangerous. And then after that, they went home. Once they got home, Alspy saw that her mom wasn't home, which is very unlike her because her mom never left the farm or went too far away and even if she did she would let people know where she was going. Also I went to the community members that were nearby and told them that her mother wasn't home but everyone was too scared to go help her look because it was dark and they had literally just seen a random man in the farm like on the farm and also I didn't want to go by herself so they just didn't go searching for her mother. On Mother's Day, the 7th of May, Alspy's mother's body was found. Her son and his friend were playing nearby a dam and a stranger told them to go play somewhere else because there was glass on the floor. So after this, they went down the hill near the dam and as they were walking down, they saw a body of what they thought was a man in the dam and they started screaming, went to the dam and pulled this body out. It was only once they pulled the body out that they saw that it was Alspide's mother. She had been raped and strangled and left in the irrigation dam. This was the third body to be found within weeks, all of them women who had been raped and beaten. Soon the perpetrators started attacking men. Titus Jacobs was attacked with an iron pole while walking home from a neighboring farm. The people in Philippi love drinking during the weekend, as do most people, and the killer knew this, and it would later come to light that he would use this as an opportunity to attack them when their guards were down. He would watch them he would watch them on top of the mountain, see like see them getting drunk, intoxicated, let's try that again. So he would basically sit on top of the mountain, watch them drink throughout the night, see like when they got really intoxicated and like when they probably most likely wouldn't remember like what happened and this is like when he would attack and kill them. So most of the killings happened during the weekend. Um, 
after people were like drinking or went to bed. By the end of July, six bodies had been recovered in the dam and this also included men. The men were attacked by an axe. And because there were so many murders and attacks going on in Philippi, community members were terrified because they didn't know who was going to be next. And because of this, people gathered their families and they left because they didn't want to be a part of it and they didn't want to be the killer's next victims. This killer had no particular pattern in terms of who he would kill and how. At first, he would kill women. Afterwards, he started attacking attacking men, then he started killing men, and afterwards he started attacking couples. So he would wait in the bush, and even if he saw like a woman walking by herself, he probably wouldn't attack. He would wait for a couple, and then he would go to them, and he would kill the guy, then rape the woman and kill her afterwards. Or at times he would just rape the woman and not harm her after that, or like not kill her. This killer would later be known as the Jesus killer. And there are so many reasons why people say that he's known as the Jesus killer. And different articles say different things. So I'm not too sure which one is the right reason why he's known as the Jesus killer. But the first one is apparently he has a tattoo of a cross on his chest. The second one is that he has... Um, Jesus tattooed on his upper lip. The third one is that he used ash and wrote Jesus on his forehead. And the th fourth one is that it was later found out that he told one of his victims, I am Jesus and I am coming to take you tonight. The killing stopped for a while and the community of Philippi were finally at ease and they felt as though they could continue with their lives as normal. But unfortunately, this didn't last for long and just two months later in October, the Jesus killer struck again. Mina and her Lucas Manuel were asleep in their house when their door was kicked in. The perpetrator dragged Lucas out of the house and afterwards raped Mina. And after he left, Mina was in so much pain and was too terrified to go look for her husband. So she waited until sunrise. She then went to go look for her husband and unfortunately she found him by the dam and lying next to him was one of their neighbours. They had both been hacked with an axe. Mina claims that her attacker didn't work alone. She says that once the door was kicked in, there were two men that stood in the bedroom and then they dragged her husband Lucas out and then the Jesus killer is the one that stayed behind and thereafter raped her. There were so many murders happening in Philippi at the same time that on one occasion there was a funeral held for three people on the same day. By October, eight people had been murdered and six women had been raped and still police officers didn't think that there was a killer and they said that all the cases were being investigated separately. However, the media did report that there was a serial killer. Police officers um, really just didn't care about this case. When a body would be found and journalists would arrive on the scene, they would shout at them, tell them not to take pictures and tell them that they were scaring the community by telling them that there was a serial killer when there wasn't and their police work was just terrible. They wouldn't take all the evidence that they would find at the scene. They didn't interview all of the victims and the witnesses and overall they just did like a really terrible job and yeah. This was until um, the Jesus killer himself started taunting the police and leaving letters and sketches. And in these sketches, he would basically just draw where they could find the most recent victim's body. And because of this, they couldn't really deny that there wasn't a serial killer operating in Philippi anymore. And probably for the first time in months, they actually had to take their job seriously. And there was so much pressure. There's just like a lot of pressure. I don't know why I paused for so long. <laughs> yeah, there was just like a lot of pressure. And on one occasion, the Jesus killer actually led them to one of um, a victim's bodies. So what had happened is that um, the Jesus killer attacked a woman and she told him that if he was going to kill her, may he please um, 
tell her friend where her body is and the jesus killer stuck to his word he went looking for the friend and then he would check on the body um every couple of hours to see whether the police had discovered it or not and after two or three days of the body having not been discovered the perpetrator or the jesus killer left um a sketch on the victim's friend's door with where the body could be located she took it to the police office Officers, and this is how they managed to find her body. A month later, police officers finally made an arrest and it was 49-year-old Stanley Martins. Stanley Martins had previous brushes with the law and they had found him walking alone in the bush and claimed that he was their guy. That we've got our suspect and we are convinced that we've got the right person. A picture of Stanley was shown to some of the victims and all of them said that he wasn't the guy but police just really wanted this case to be over and done with and he was literally just a scapegoat. He went to trial and there was just not enough evidence to convict him of this crime and afterwards all the charges against him were dropped but his image was forever tainted. The murders continued and finally in December at one of the crime scenes a phone is left behind. Police officers went through all the contacts on this phone and it led them to a nearby community called Krabo and the person that they found was Daryl and Daryl would soon lead them to 41 year old Jimmy Maget. Jimmy was born and raised in Khrabo and he was one of 15 children. He often ran away from school and home and would often be caught in fights. He was cruel to animals and he performed bestiality and if you don't know what bestiality is you must search it. It's basically just having sex, having intercourse with an animal. So that's what Jimmy did. That's what he did. Jimmy was a local painter and he lived in the bushes around Philippi. He was out on parole for attempted murder. After he was taken into custody, he denied everything with having to do like with the Jesus killer and during the investigation, they could only link him to two of the crime scenes. And even these things weren't the rape or murder or attempted murder. It was just um, assault and a break-in. In the 1980s, Jimmy met his first wife, Janetta, and they got married in the ninth, in the mid-1980s. They went on to have three children, and Janetta says that at first their relationship was it was literally just amazing. Nothing was wrong. Jimmy didn't show like any signs of being abusive or anything like that. But after they got married, his true colors showed. Literally the night that they got married, like the same day that they got married, like that very night. Does that make sense? Yeah. That very night, he fought her, like he beat her up so badly in his sister's room, in one of his sister's room, that the wall had her blood on it for almost two years. And the only reason why the blood eventually came off the walls is that she went there and she cleaned it herself. Throughout their marriage, Jimmy was extremely abusive towards Janetta, but the final straw was when she found out that he was having an affair. After this, she filed for divorce and banned him from going to their house or seeing his kids. After his divorce from Janetta, Jimmy married one of his childhood friends, Anna Arnster. And like Janet, their relationship was great in the beginning, but after they got married, he showed his true colors. He would hit her so hard that her blood would be all over the walls and door. And I don't know if it's on multiple occasions or on one occasion, but Jimmy beat Anna up so much that the next day her friend called her mother and told her to go to the house to go check if Anna was still alive. <coughs> Bless me. Okay. Anna says that she believes that Jimmy is the Jesus killer 
and that he murdered and raped all those men and women because of what she experienced and she doesn't put it past him. The only evidence that the prosecution had against Jimmy was a letter that he had written to the investigating officer, basically just describing some of the murders and what had happened and attached to it was a sketch of the Philippi area and on the sketch you can see where he lived, where some of his victims lived. Um, um, as well as where the bodies were found in the area by the dams and not just like where like not just like a random dam but like specifically where in the dam the bodies were dumped i hope that makes sense yeah so he gave this to the investigating officer and afterwards um the lawyer that was given to him by the state kept telling him to stop writing letters to the investigating officer but jimmy didn't listen and then he wrote another letter to the investigating officer and this time he explained three murders that um took place nearly like five years before the Jesus killer spree and one of these cases was where he says that there was a woman walking in the bushes with her baby so he grabbed her and the baby fell like in the footpath and he dragged her into the bushes proceeded to rape her and then strangled her to death and the baby was later found and this case is true it was unsolved and everything Jimmy said um, linked to the evidence that they had as well as the other two cases that he had written that were unsolved like everything was just true and he was guilty of it Jimmy was surprised to learn that the letters and the sketches that he had given to the investigating officer would be used as evidence and it's like he almost just knew that he he messed up like he just messed up by writing those letters and afterwards Jimmy Magette pleaded guilty to 47 charges 19 for rape 16 for murder six house break-ins two robberies, two attempted murders, and two assaults. Jimmy will be eligible for parole in 2031, which is literally less than 10 years away. How crazy. The other two assailants that were mentioned earlier in the case um, were never found or never linked to Jimmy Maggett. And that's it for today's case. Thank you guys so, so much for watching. Please don't forget to subscribe and click the notification bell so you can be notified when I upload. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye!